We're a community where news and information is created by our team of journalists. We ask tough questions and we simplify the science so that anyone can understand. We don't only cover disease, but delve into the latest research on what it takes to keep our brains healthy. Aside from the experts, we also interview people diagnosed with dementia. Being Patient Perspectives looks at that first-person perspective of people living with dementia. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Being Patient Perspectives. I'm Deborah Kahn, founder of Being Patient. It is great, with great pleasure um, we have joining us again, Herda Saunders and her husband, Peter. Um, we've asked them to come on Being Patient again, not only to uh, have a check-in with Herda on how she's doing, but also because um, we, they have just released um, an incredible documentary um, on um, uh, Herda. It's called That Herda, uh, The Herda That Remains. And I can't recommend it enough. It's so well produced. Um, and it's just really a pleasure to see you both. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, sure. thank, thank you for asking us. Thank you. So Herda, before we started this video, um, it's been over a decade since you were diagnosed with a type of vascular dementia, but 10 years on now, and you are saying to me, you're not actually even sure that that's the correct diagnosis. So tell us a little bit about that. How could that be that you could be living with memory loss for 10 years, but you still don't actually know exactly what you have? Uh I don't know. Are we going to the best doc doctors in Utah? At the, uh, 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 never mind, I won't say, but um, they, they are wonderful people. And so many people whom I know from the Alzheimer's support groups and so on have gone there. Um, but they actually had a similar experience to me that they was, were diagnosed with something and then with further tests, they did not seem to have that anymore. And some get re-diagnosed with something else, but I, I did not. I chose not to keep on doing that because it's an incredibly stressful for us both. How can, let's talk about that a little bit because, you know, I know there's a lot of people like you <laughs> who live with dementia, but don't act exactly know and spend years trying to figure out what exactly, what type of dementia. And just to clarify for people who may not be as familiar with dementia, dementia is really the umbrella term for different types of neurological disorders that cause memory loss. Um, Alzheimer's is obviously the most common one. Um, vascular dementia, FTD, Lewy body, just to name a few, um, but there are a lot of people out there who find diagnosis so stressful. Um, why is that? Tell us from your perspective, why is it so stressful to go through the testing and, and really search for the answers? Um, this, this is not a critique of my doctors at all. Each of them is very specialized in what they're doing. So this person does the, uh, the neurological ima ima imaging, yeah. yeah. And that this person does the neurological testing. And, um, you know, each one has, has a role and they work as a team, but I did not see that the results of my neurological tests uh, were taken into account as much as Peter and I believe it should be because they really explain uh, what's wrong with me. And we have um, graphs that we can show you, but I don't know if you want to do it here or if you want, want to send it to you later. But these graphs show I'm very particularly um, affected in certain areas of the brain. So of you're looking brain. at your, is it an MRI? Is it a, a, a PET yeah. scan, a CAT scan? No, no, this, this is the neurological testing of the areas in which I do not function well. Mm -hmm. And the, um, the 
my speaking is the best of all. And um, if you want to, Peter, could just hold up the graph. I think Eden. Sure. I, you, do you want to share the screen? Is it on your computer? That would be wonderful. Uh, yeah. Peter knows. Peter do you knows. You want me just to show it like this? Okay. Or, or, or do you want me to share it on the computer? Uh, why don't you share it on the computer? Yeah, well, okay, and, sure. and while you do that, while you're getting ready for that, um, I, I, I allowed you to share. Um, but so are you, you know, are you talking about the results from cognitive testing? So a doctor asking you questions, is that right? Yes, that's right. That's what I'm talking about. And, and my and Peter's descriptions of what the things are that I don't do well. And then there are tests where, where um, I do, you, you know, I, I think what, what happens when they give you the report, it's a, what, a 17 page report, but it's, it's written and they sort of, they have numbers, but they sort of average them out to right. determine where you are. So it shows that I'm just in the very beginning of mild uh, the, um, the, um, almost at the middle one, what is it? Uh, Mild cognitive impairment? No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm a step. Oh, you mean in the seven stages, you're in the yeah, middle the seven so you're like four or five. I'm at four, yeah. four or five, that's right. Yeah. And uh, this graph will also show it. Yeah. All right, why don't I, you share I, it? I, 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 okay, it's just Peter, Peter's uh, getting okay. it ready to share. Okay, let's see. Well, while he uh, does that, I want to say that my daughter is a data analyst and she did a PhD in, she started out in biology, but she ended up in um, chemistry, but chemistry and physics. And so so she just, um, she made these uh, charts for us. She has another bi biology background to understand that. And she, um, she has the data analysis skills to um, to be able to um, look at the data and find a good way to show it. Can you see that? Yes, chart? we can see it. Okay, take us. Okay. Wow, like okay. this is amazing. Like we're being enlightened by you okay. about diagnosis. This is incredible. So tell us this. Is, okay. So this is so, a model. So let, I'll, Peter will explain. Let, I'm not okay. good at that. Let me tell you what we've got here. The circle, the black circle where I'm pointing the arrow at is 100% performance. The green is where Gerda was prior to her, her dementia. So you can see she was performing at a very high mm -hmm. uh, score. To be honest. The black line here is the average in the US score on these different categories. And the red and below is the impaired uh, area from mild to severely impaired. And so what, um, what we've done here is to take the scores in this particular uh, chart is the language functioning, visuospatial and constructional functioning. And the measurements from the neurological test are in blue. So you can see oh, my that, test. that's her test. So Hara is very good at verbal comprehension. Yes. She's great at verbal information, verbal abstract reasoning, and vocabulary. But she drops into the impaired state here for things like visual puzzles, construction capability, visual perception, and so on. And in fact, um, if I um, go over one now, let me just see. So this one is another chart, which is her attention working memory, processing speed, and motor function. And you can see the blue, where Gerard tests is all in the severely impaired area. So we've got more charts here. Uh, this one is interesting because, uh, particularly because her cognitive flexibility and problem solving is still so very high, she's able to get around a lot of her problems by making alternate plans or different words and so she's good at that. So, so wait, at let me just say, because for people do, who don't know her, da, um, she has a very high IQ, obviously. She was a mathematician. She taught math, right, for many years. And, um, and, English, and in English. And English. And 
uh, has obviously a very high cognitive reserve. And the, it's so interesting to look at this data in the, in, in the way that it's presented, because obviously it's been over 10 years since you had a diagnosis, you're still able to communicate. You haven't lost your communication skills, which, right. you know, which is true to what we're seeing with the cognitive yes. testing. I, I, I would like to say one thing. I'm very good at communication when it's one on one, or I can, we can have up to two people there, but only one at a time speaking. And then I can communicate. But if it's three people uh, two talking sort of to and fro, my, I cannot catch up with a conversation at all. And that so, could have to do with the attention piece of it. Right? Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So that, that, wait, show us that score again, Peter, the attention. This one. So, on the first page. In oh. the middle. Yeah, yeah, so in the middle you can see she's really, all these ca categories which are working memory index, processing speed, which is particularly uh, obvious when we, when we are down together, um, uh, implicit memory, uh, visual scanning, in other words, she's, she's not so good anymore, she's very bad actually at looking at multiple things, the deciding what is good. In fact, she's even not able to, you know, if you look at say five marbles lying on the table, then you just have to glance at it and say there's five, but she can't do that anymore. Yeah. And, so, so, and I also get lost. Isn't getting lost part of it? I think so as well, the, the visual scanning to see where you are. Okay, I have a couple questions. Like number one, I just want to say this is all. This is also proof of how important it is for each and every one of us to have a baseline, right? So you obviously had a baseline looking. Um, so you knew when pre morbid, you had this information, right? Pre morbid. So did you have cognitive testing before you yes, were diagnosed? Yes. Uh, that was when I was a young person, um, and I also have to say that is an average score. It's not, I was not that good in all the categories uh, from the beginning, but some categories were higher and some lower, but the average was, was that. But I, yes, and I, I mean, and obviously you have pretty high scores. You're almost to the edge of the, you know, um, but it also shows me that, you know, you also have probably a very high cognitive reserve as well in, in areas. Now, what's fascinating to me, and, and this is what's so great that I love that you're showing us this. In fact, I was intending to talk to you about the documentary and we're gonna talk about the documentary, but this is fascinating to me because what this is showing us is what you are able to analyze through the use of uh, uh, reports and everything. This is not coming from a doctor. This is what you are generating yourself, right? And um, which part of the brain judging from this, do you feel like it is more impacted than the others at the frontal cortex, um, hippocampus, you know, we know Alzheimer's traditionally impacts the hippocampus first, but you haven't had a diagnosis of Alzheimer's. So is it your frontal cortex? What is it? I believe a, a lot of it is frontal lobe and I, I still can, can know what the pieces of the brain do if I have a a diagram in front of me and I've looked at that and so it is that but it's also starting to be um, whatever that thing is that controls emotions uh, I think it's the it's got a cute little name uh, like hippopotamus something hippocampus oh hippocampus. Okay. yeah that's memory isn't that memory that, that's um, that's memory but it it's where the where you connect memory with with um, with visual images and with smells, and you know, so that I, you can recognize a particular person's face. Okay. I I still I recognize the faces of my immediate family and my very close friends, but I if I meet people and I see them again the next day, just like in the supermarket, and for some reason we talk and I see them again, they say hi to me, then I can see they saying hello to me like somebody who knows who I am. And I sadly have to say, I'm so sorry. I 
believe we've met, but I just cannot remember where. And then they would say, oh, we met yesterday in the parking lot, you know. Right. So, but, so, but then that causes, that causes me, um, you know, the inter interaction with, with other people and with, with, um, uh, with, with strangers or with a group of people, I cannot catch on this. And then I recede emotionally. Mm -hmm. I sort of feel like going to a, a sort of an empty space and I, um, um, and then, then I don't feel emotion toward them. Mm -hmm. In fact, if I feel emotion, it's like anger. Be yeah. Especially if it's people to whom we've explained this and asked to, you know, speak one at a time or, uh, you know, something like that, then, then I, I sort of go toward anger. Mm -hmm. And so far, <laughs> I've only expressed my anger, luckily, to Peter. Peter, <laughs> Peter. Yeah. So, okay, wait, I, I just want to ask you a question about this too, um, because I think it's really important. You were diagnosed with a type of vascular dementia. Why don't you think that this is indicative of vascular dementia? I'm, I'm taking my lead from the doctors who said the lesions that they can see on the MRI does not explain all of these um, uh, difficulties. Right. So uh, they suggested that from the very beginning, they suggested that I probably have another form of dementia as well. Right. But the only one they tested, well, until we asked them, said we wouldn't, didn't want to do it anymore. The only one they tested was Alzheimer's. So they confirmed that I do not have Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And um, I, you know, anyway, I, I yeah, said- so I, mean, I mean, basically I think what's this situation is that they trying to find the, the origin and cause of these items that you see on the screen as to why they're so low. And they say, okay, it's vascular dementia, but we, we think there's something else involved, but we don't quite know what it is yet. We'd like to test more. But then we both had a discussion about it and said, you know, I don't, we don't know if there's going to be any value to us to discover more about the origin of her dementia because we're dealing with it and it's here and we don't think there's anything we can do about it. So why create additional stress? Yeah, and I okay. Um, you can take the screen share down, um, Peter, okay. and we'll continue the conversation. And I I completely understand that. And it's a story that we hear over and over again. Um, it's it is very hard um, for so many people with the the whole process of diagnosis. And it's been I mean, and again, I make this point. It hasn't just been one year. You've been living with this for ten years, right? So that's a long time yeah. um, to go through testing. I want to go now to a, a bit of the personal, um, your personal story, Herta, because um, I, I, you know, I met you a few years ago and um, I just was so drawn in by the documentary that was made um, about your journey um, because it really, to me, proved um, the importance of a partnership and the documentary again is called the Gerd, the hair dad that remains and it really is so touching to watch because for every single moment that i watched it was a, a it was presented as a partnership it wasn't i didn't feel like you were alone in this so i want to talk a little bit about that because it's a different journey when you have someone to, to walk down a path with, is it, is it not? I, I want both of your comments on that. I think most definitely, because uh, if, if I were on my own, I would definitely be in some a care place. I could not live by my own. Um, and uh, I just, it, but it's of course way beyond that to have someone and, I really think we are soul friends after 54 years of knowing each other. And that too is very fortunate. All relationships don't end like that. 
And so many people I know are single in the when they're older. And I I can see how wonderful my world is, which is why I I'm not allowed to not be joyful. And I felt like when I was watching the documentary, Peter, that it was more a love story than <laughs> something about dementia. It was so lovely to watch. And uh -huh. I, I really got tearful at points of, of the, the film. Um, it really does feel like a, a love story. It feels like, Peter, you're so committed and, and committed in a way that I, it's quite extraordinary. I mean, you, you know, it- Well, you know, you well, you know, I mean, we have been together for a long time and, um, and Gerda, you know, is basically, I've got a lot of respect for her. Of course, I love her a lot. And so it's nice to do things together. So now it's changed a lot. And um, obviously, you know, she's not as independent as she used to be. And um, I help her, you know, a hundred times a day with things like telephone calls and her computer and her budget and everything. And, and but for me, it's, it's nice. It's, you know, she always used to do everything for me. And so, so in some way, I feel that I'm able to repay that, okay, by being there for her. So that's really, and of course, you know, she has to live with my humor. I, <laughs> I joke a lot about her, you know, to her and with friends and so on. And, and, and that helps as well because it brings a little light, I think, to, to our life because otherwise it can get a pretty down, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I you know, as I was watching the, doc, the film, I was typing down notes because you said so many poignant things, Erda, you said, at one point you said, it feels like every level of my formal, former self is being scraped away. Do you remember saying that in the film? I, I know that it's something that that I have said or written. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, so what is that? Tell, just elaborate a little bit about that. Like in day to day life, what does that mean? Um, I used to be able to. We were we were very social in the way that, in the sense that we always invited people to our house. And we made, uh, I really made all the, the food. Um, and I, I, I would do it over a period, sometimes of two weeks, you know, make things that you can freeze and take out. And I now cannot, uh, I cannot some days make a cup of coffee. And, um, and also from the day, I, I think I, told the story to you last time about when we'd invited the kids over and when they got there, I realized I'd forgotten to, to actually cook the food that I'd made and it was like frozen and so on. And from that day onward, which is now probably eight years ago or, or, less, or more, I have not, we've not had a, a meal at our house for which I was responsible. Mm -hmm. Or uh, this weekend, for example, we celebrated my daughter's birthday, our wedding anniversary, and uh, my daughter's husband's birthday. And um, my daughter's husband arranged a party, a, seek, a surprise party for his wife. And we all, we celebrated everything at that. And nobody, for this one, nobody cooked. Other, other times when we, celebrate at one of their or our homes over us, we, um, you know, everybody helps cook or we order food in. We mm -hmm. only eat ordered food. So in the f documentary, if you see there's always pizza beans. <laughs> <laughs> You'll know that that's not- Well, I've got to just say that Gerda cooks a lot at home. So she, we actually share, so she makes lunch, which is our, our big meal of the day. And I make various kinds of salads for the evening. So we share that, but we eat a lot at home of our own home cooking. And so, yeah. 
you know, I say to her, as long as she can make a meat pie, I'll stick with her. <laughs> Until she can't, she has to be watch out. <laughs> that's, good. that's incredibly good motivation. <laughs> yeah. So, but, yeah. but oh, so, I'm sorry. I, no, go ahead. My main form, well, I won't say my main form, but a core of my self de definition was that my brain worked well, which gave me many opportunities in my life and um, and I, you know with my teaching and other jobs that I'd had and I, I also I lost that sense of identification after my university studies uh, and later on when I had children because I was a full-time mom for and uh, for a number of years and I was just researched that. I read every child development book I did. Mm -hmm. I did all those things. I always went into it with my brain, but I hope my heart was the thing that followed through. So that to me, I, I, I'm so sad very often when I'm with my grandchildren and I, I cannot have the kind of conversations with them that I had with my own children about uh, astronomy, about a plate tectonics and that to me that speaking about that kind of thing it's like a metaphor of how I feel about life and about everything so I cannot convey that to them in the way that I could to my children but so it fits my relationship with them them and not I believe from their perspective so much but from my perspective it feels like a diminished relationship compared to, and even the, the relationship I had with my oldest grandson when I could still do things like that. Mm -hmm. So those are the things that constant piece of my, of my former self that are chipping off. <laughs> I, I found it so heartwarming um, in the film when, and, and clever too, that you have the awareness to realize, oh, I can't remember how to put together outfits anymore. So you keep um, a photographic album of different outfits to remind yourself. And then I remember you couldn't find a pair of shoes. And so you go to Peter, help me find my shoes. And But that was just beautiful in, in the sense that you have very high coping mechanisms to navigate this. I'm not so sure, you know, and, and I think that's a great lesson to be learned because yes, you may have been very much more independent previously, but what you're doing is you're figuring out strategies to maintain that independence as much as you possibly can. And then you have Peter there when you just need yeah. a, little bit of, a little push, right? right. Well, that's, that's true. And that always has to be adapted and I can still do it, but it takes me forever. I, my closet now consists of uh, white uh, pillowcases and in between them are all the parts of an outfit because I couldn't do the use the photos anymore. I couldn't figure out from the photos, uh, you know, what the outfit was. So now I have also what helps a lot, we downscaled so much when moving to an apartment and that helps a lot yeah. too. It's yeah, because it, it, it's less confusing, right? It's just yeah. smaller spaces to navigate. Peter, what have you noticed in terms of changes in Erga? Um, what have you noticed big changes or? Yeah, um, well, yes, I have, and she, you know, she's, um, you know, much more, she gets anxious very quickly um, for, because she, I think, because she gets frustrated and um, and also if there's a lot of things happening, say three or four things happening at once, then she gets very frustrated and she, you know, she starts, you can see she's getting very nervous. So that's a big change in her. I mean, the biggest change, of course, is um, is the, um, the sadness that I can see that she has because of a loss of independence. I mean, you know, for her, like last week, we went, a week before last, we went to Las Vegas for a few days. And that's her favorite place. Because it, I hate Las Vegas, actually. <laughs> she hates it, but where we go to, uh, from the hotel, there's a bridge across the road to a shopping area where she cannot get lost. 
And so she can walk there, she can go and have food, she can have some coffee, and she doesn't need me at all. And that, no, gives, her, <laughs> that gives her a lot of, of thought that she's got some independence like that. And so that, those are the big changes. And of course, you know, funny enough, she also is fumbles a lot. <laughs> okay. yeah. That and I think that's part of the of the dementia is that she drops things and spills things and then gets embarrassed when she does that. So mm. those are the kind of things that that she does. She, you know. Yeah. Anyway. I I want to mention one thing, and that is that I have huge difficulties with um, not being motivated or, or apathy because I get negative feedback from my environment all the time. I try to do something, I break it. I try to do something, it falls on the floor. I try to do something, I do it wrong. And, you know, I, it, it brings you to a point that you think, I, I, um, I, after some mornings with, with three th like things like that in a row, I just say to Peter, oh, I've got to go and sit on my bed and, and listen to my audio book. I just need to withdraw from the world. So that, that, that's a big difficulty for me. Yeah, I, I, I could understand that and the frustration over the changes, but I, I, I mean this um, and I'm being very honest with you. I kept thinking to myself as I was watching the film, I got to show this to my husband because it got, you know, God forbid I end up with dementia. This is how I want him to be with me. <laughs> and it, it's really a lovely story. And, you know, I, I applaud you both because you're creating a wonderful model for, for other people who are going through dementia of what it really looks like to have a strong partnership and how much help um, that is. Um, I want to just really encourage people to watch the, the documentary that Herida That Remains. We can publish the link on this. Um, it's It was I, made by PBS Utah, I believe. Is that right? Right, yeah. Yeah, and it's really a beautiful film um, uh, of one hour. And, you know, I learned so much from it. Um, and I also love the honesty that you two share. I mean, you really share, uh, you know, I really feel, Peter, you're so honest with, with Erda and you don't uh, want to keep things from her. You, but you're, yeah. you, but, and that's important, right? The, the yeah, honesty. That is, yeah. I think a lot of people struggle with that because they think, oh, well, should I make, and I do with my own mom, like, should I make her feel better than what she really is? But just quickly before we go, Peter, tell us a little bit about that. Like, how do you handle that? Are you, do you feel like, you know, you, did you make a pact early on that you'd just be honest with one another? Yeah, I think I did. I just decided that, you know, we, we do share things with each other and try not to have uh, to make soften the blow, if you like. I mean, obviously, in some ways, we, we try to be circumspect about how we approach the issue. But, you know, I, I'm very clear with her about what she what she's is and how she's going through that. And, you know, I make jokes about my crazy wife and things like that. And she, and she accepts it. I think sometimes she got a little bit angry with me <laughs> no no i don't and we use words like crazy or mad from you know we grew up m with colonial english yes. and and so, on. So those are words we can say in our family i know that those words don't work for every family but in private basically you can tell me anything <laughs> or call me anything and i'm fine with that and vice and, versa and, and uh, i mean she she even comes and well, when she buys a new top, would come and show me, and um, I'm allowed to say it doesn't look so good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the true mark of honesty, right? Uh, well, thank you both again. Um, I, I love checking in with you. This is not going to be the last interview, so, and um, I feel completely inspired by both of you. Um, I really encourage our viewers to watch the documentary. We've posted the link, um, and it's amazing. It really is. Um, and it, it leaves you feeling really good. And thank you for sharing your story once again. This won't be the last time we speak. I promise you that. Um, those models your daughter created are, are incredible. I mean, would you mind if we shared those as well? 
not, not at all. Not at all. Yeah, We've okay. shown them at conferences and so on of caretakers or nurses or so. And they said, I, I wish I had a, a graph like that for every one of my patients. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. We'll figure out a way to publish that for right. um, our audience. But thank you, Peter. Thank you, Erda. Um, I wish you all both the best. And we're going to check in with you soon. Again, I hope it's not a few years. We're going to check in with you sooner. But so no, thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you very well, much. I'd Deborah. be very happy to speak to you again. Okay. okay. Thank you. And the best thank of luck to all of you, to both of you. Um, if you want to learn more or you missed any of this interview, we always repost them on beingpatient.com. Thanks everyone for watching and we'll see you next time. Take care. Thank you, thank you very much. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. For more information on upcoming interviews, don't forget to sign up for our newsletter at beingpatient.com. That's B-E-I-N-G-P-A-T-I-E-N-T dot com. And send us any feedback you may have, whether it's someone you want us to interview or any comment about our podcast series. You can do so by emailing info at beingpatient.com. Thanks for listening, everyone. I'm Deborah Kahn.